Hello students, in this video we'll prove that the composition of the continuous function and a Riemann integrable function is also Riemann integrable. If f is Riemann integrable, on AB, then F is automatically bounded, right? So it's going to be bounded. This means that F is stuck between a little m and a big M. And let's suppose that a function phi is continuous. If phi is continuous on little m to big M, then we can prove the composition of phi with f is Riemann integrable. Then g of x, which is phi of f of x, is Riemann integrable as well. Okay. So how are we going to prove this? Well, we can do a couple things. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to let epsilon be greater than 0 and pick delta greater than 0, such that what? Such that phi of x minus phi of y less than epsilon if x minus y less than delta. And actually, let me modify this a little bit. So let me put this epsilon over what? Over 2 times b minus a. That will help out my overall proof. And then I'm going to pick a partition p. So let's pick p. Pick P such that, such that what? Such that the sum, J goes from 1 to N, of the supremum over the intervals IJ in my partition of F of X minus the infimum over the intervals IJ of F of X xj minus xj minus 1 is less than what? Is less than delta squared over 4 times the soup of absolute value phi. On, it's the soup of phi over where it's defined over this set negative m to m. Okay, I can always make sure this happens because f is integrable over here. And of course, what are the ij's? So of course, ij here is going to be what? So ij is really what? Is really xj minus 1 to xj. So here ij is x, j minus 1 to x, j are the points of my partition. Great. All right, so now I'm going to make a couple observations. So now I'd like to actually show, so one thing we can actually glean from this characterization over here is I can do this. So now I'm going to break my indexing set 1 to n up into two different sets, okay? So here's going to be the first set, my partition. The first set we're going to get is this. I'm going to look at sets A, which are the sets of j, such that what? It's a set of j, such that the soup of f on ij minus the inf of f on ij is less than delta. And then the set b is going to be the set j, such that the soup of f over ij minus the inf over ij of f is greater than or equal to delta. So one of two things happens. Either the soup, either the oscillation in ij is less than delta or the oscillation in ij is bigger than delta. So one of those two things will happen. Now what I want to do is I want to at least make an inequal, I want to estimate what happens the total overall total length of the set b where the set is small. So by this assumption over here what can I say? I can say that delta times the sum over those indices j and b of xj minus xj minus 1 well, I can replace delta with what? I can replace. I can make this bigger by replacing delta with the soup minus the inf. So I can re I can actually majorize this quantity over here by taking the delta, putting in the soup and the inf into this sum over here, and I know that that whole quantity is less than what? Is less than delta squared over four times the soup of phi. So this is less than delta squared over four times the soup of absolute value phi. And so the conclusion from this is that the sum over those indices in B, J in the bad set of xj minus xj minus 1, the overall length of that set is less than what? Is less than or equal to delta 
over 4 times the soup of phi. Okay? That's an inequality we're going to need. Good. So now what? So now I'd like to estimate um, g on this partition, right? So let's consider this thing over here. I'm going to consider the sum j goes from 1 up to n of the soup over ij of this function g of x minus the inf over ij of g of x times xj minus xj minus 1. Okay? So now I'm going to break this into two, two sums over here. So I'm going to call this whole expression, just for simplicity, let's call this whole expression over here star, right? And so this is going to be equal to the sum over those j's that reside in the set A of star plus the sum over all those indices j that reside in the set B of star. Okay? Now what can I say? I know that on the set B, let's look at this, let's look at this, for this sum over here. So we're going to estimate both these sums by it, one by one. So this sum over here, let's call, so let's call this thing over here, um, let's call this thing over here I sub A, and let's call this thing over here I sub B, okay? Now what can I say about I sub A? I sub A, well, I know that the soup of f minus the inf of f is less than delta. So the points I'm plugging into what? The points that I'm plugging in, the x points that I'm plugging into g arise from what? Those points come from what? Are really phi of what? So these things are really phi of f of x, and this is phi of f of x. So where are these po the input points for these things coming from? The input points from those values are coming from what? Are coming from points that are within one of each other. I know that on A, the soup of f minus the inf of f is less than delta. So the input points for those things are within the x minus y, are values of x such that those values are less than delta. So I can estimate I A by what? By, well, I know that these things over here are less than epsilon over 2b minus a times what? Times the sum, so this is going to be less than the sum over j and a of epsilon over 2b minus a times xj minus xj minus 1. And of course, this whole thing is less than what? Well, I can pull out the epsilon over 2b minus a, and now this might not be the full set a to b, but it's definitely majorized by b minus a. So this whole thing is less than epsilon over 2. And now over ib, what happens? Over ib, on ib, well, we know that the soup and the inf are not within this range of delta, so what can I say there? The soup and the inf of f, the input values to my function phi to my function g, are not where? are not within the range delta, which automatically implies what? This implies that I have to estimate this quantity over here, the soup of g minus inf of g, by the largest it can be. What's the largest it can be? The largest it can be there is really what? This is less than or equal to the sum j and b of just 2 times the soup, 2 times the soup of g, which is the soup of phi, times what? 2 times the soup of phi times the change xj minus xj minus 1. Okay? So now, but of course, what do we know about the sum over j and b of xj minus xj minus 1? It's less than delta over 4 super phi. So this thing over here is less than or equal to what? This thing, the 2 is going to cancel, the super phi is going to cancel, and we left with the delta over 2. So I have a delta over 2. So i a plus i b is less than epsilon over 2 plus delta over 2. So from the outset, whenever you choose delta greater than 0, you can always assume without loss of generality that delta is what? Delta can always be assumed to be less than epsilon without loss of generality. If it wasn't less than epsilon, make it less than epsilon, and then you'll still have this continuity condition be satisfied. So since delta is less than epsilon, this is less than epsilon over 2. And so all we have the i a plus i b is less than epsilon over 2 plus epsilon over 2. Therefore, the supreme over here is less than epsilon, and therefore the function g is Riemann integral. Thank you very much.